My name is Charles Peckham, and uh, you are my victims for this session. Uh, I'm coming from this from a different point of view. Uh, the process for submitting presentations to be considered a speaker at Tableau from a customer standpoint starts in the April May timeframe, and then it, there is a several iterations and talks with facilitators to get the message clearer. And that also that process also means then that between mo the months of May and September, you go back into the presentation, you go back into the tableau, you clean it up, you streamline it. So I'd say that the presentation you're seeing here is far different from what it was when I originally submitted it in May and April, April and May. Uh, but I think it gets to the point that the, the real center point of maps can be used for something different than the equivalent of a bar chart. So that with that, uh, uh, contact information. There are related sessions on maps. When I took a look uh, at the schedule, these are the only other sessions that had anything to do with maps. So I was pretty surprised about that. And we'll, we'll split up this presentation into five pieces, but I think that it's easier to sit, put it into three, and that is I have a story to tell about the, the process with the customer on getting a, a data-focused view to a map-focused view of their business and the technology. Uh, there's also a, section, a quick sec section on how do you set up a map. Uh, it's a quick tutorial that you can uh, take home and use yourself. And then there is a demo or overview of the tool as I distilled it down into this messaging. So hopefully those three pieces will, will provide some value, and that's what that is. Sienna, if you haven't heard of Sienna, is an optical company, and that's not glasses, that's fiber optics. Uh, we're responsible for some major technological advances. I know this is an eye chart from way in the back. When you download the live presentation, presentation you should be able to read it in a little bit more detail. But the, the real focus I'd like to bring up here, the context is, it's a company built by engineers to solve an engineering issue. So when we were looking at 100 gig, and well, it started off at much lower rates, but 100 gig, 200 gig, now we're moving into 400 gig traffic between data centers, backbones for service providers, underseen cable. There's a lot of high speed, low latency types of traffic that we try to support. And then we're also into packet networking and software design networking and things like that. So a couple of our customers on the upper right from my perspective, uh, there are people who, when they graduate from college, they know exactly what they're going to do, and they set a trajectory, and it's a, it's a vector that goes out, and they know exactly what they're going to be doing uh, along the way. My career didn't start out that way. I graduated from MIT in 85. That's the old part star in the lower left-hand corner. And then 17 years later, I got an MBA from North Carolina. And I decided that it, perhaps it made more sense to group things in terms of what did I learn technically along the way? What did I learn from a business perspective along the way? And then what application or what types of exposure did I have? What type of customers were was I working with? Or was I embedded in because I was an IT uh, director of IT for a law firm for six years. I'm, I'm fond of saying now I know what purgatory is. Uh, uh, but it was a really in, interesting envir environment because I learned a lot about contracts and litigation support, which then helps create a conversation later on when you're talking about a technical solution and you say, how do you manage risk? Well, if you didn't understand anything about litigation or contracts and liabilities, that conversation wouldn't have even happened or occurred along the way. So as you see, I've been working with spreadsheets since around 1982. For those of you who weren't around at that time, the spreadsheet of choice was VisiCalc, and it was horrible, uh, followed by MultiPlan and SuperCalc and Quattro, and yeah, it goes along the way. And Excel eventually came out at some point. And for the most part, between these two stars, I was acting as pre-sales engineering or IT support. 
So for the most part, I was dealing with a lot of these things, desktop publishing, SGML, before HTML was created. And then once I got into more business modeling and uh, business plans, I got much more into the Tableau. How do we want to present the data? What kind of decisions do we want to drive? And how will that, uh, and then this, it becomes more of a velocity issue. How quickly can we get to an answer that makes sense? So if I were to take a look at this from a common theme perspective, USA, uh, understand, simplify, and automate as being common themes throughout a lot of these positions over the years. My first Tableau experience, oh, by the way, out of all of that, it's, I've been using Tableau for right around three years. So in the overall scheme of things, three years out of 32 years. So there's sort of an iceberg type of thing going on there. First exposure to, say, to Tableau was on sales analysis. And like many of you, probably you're solving a problem that has to do with replacing spreadsheets because you have a lot of random and rogue data out there. And we needed to figure out a consistent way of approaching things. We had a sales force that was spending a certain amount of their time every week going manually through lists of sales in order to figure out which ones are truly theirs and which ones are not. And uh, so I built a spreadsheet for that, complete with VBA. It had automatic power uh, pivot table creation, all sorts of wonderful things like that. And then once we bought and put it into Tableau, the conversation shifted. So now they could turn around and say, how do we manage to improve the business? How can we manage to take a look at the proportion of our debookings against the, the regular business? Where do we see the, the most risk associated with this? And part of the thing I also wanted to mention is this was totally outside of sales administration. This was driven by the sales team itself because they didn't trust sales administration, administration for their own commission checks. So it was a matter of us being able to come together and say, here's a consistent way of looking at the data, and we're able to force that change onto sales administration to where they actually believe our number is better than their own. So I'd say this is a classic-based type of thing where we had action-based filters to be able to drill down into the, into the roles. The original optical network analysis that we'll be looking at today was originally a heat map request. And if you're not familiar with heat maps, it's kind of like a mileage map. You have two, you have a map of all possible endpoints, and then you have, I have a picture a little, a little bit later on, you have some notion of wave blockage, wavelength blockage. So you have 88 channels between locations, sort of like an 88 lane highway between every city, and, but when you have a service riding on that 88 channel, then that lane is blocked for the entire path. So when you're trying to go from San, from San Francisco to New York, that becomes a big issue. If a little spot between St. Louis and Kansas City is blocked all the way across, you're out of luck. This becomes a, this becomes a packing issue, if you think, like mathematical packing and topology kinds of things. So we're trying to figure out the best packing method to be able to put all those wavelengths in so that they are being used most efficiently. Now, optimizing a network like this is very difficult because you, have to, you either have to produce redundant services and then have the traffic running on both, on both links before you take something down, or you can use something like OTN, optical transport networking, to provide a failover path while you're, while you're reassigning links. Anyway, it's very labor intensive, and we want to be able to avoid having to deal with optimization after the fact. Originally, this is really, this is true. There are like 50 spreadsheets that they use, uh, that you know, customers typically use, covering different regions. They'll have PDF files of the Visio diagrams of the channels being used between individual locations and the serial numbers of every device that's there. And they will manually draw the lines across. And inside the spreadsheets, they'll have different color codings for different services, or they might use bold font. It, it, it depends on the, the regional manager of how they've decided to, to do this. So trying to integrate these into one thing from a data mediation standpoint is virtually impossible. Our client tried to do something similar to, the, to this model 
in California, where they were just taking a look at the Los Angeles area and, and their boxes there, they're called Rotoms, Reconfigurable Optical Ad Drop Mux uh, Theory. That's a five letter acronym for you. Uh, and it took them six weeks to build out a Visio diagram to say, here's where the wavelength blockage is between this set of, I think it was around eight sites. And it, it was immediately out of date because since that time, new services are being loaded on, services would be taken off, and so they never really had an accurate idea of what was going on. And they also have the idea of, are we really getting our entire network? Do we really know that we have a complete set of data? And the answer to that, until they cleaned up their data quite a ways down the line, was no. They were always working off of an incomplete set of data. So having some notion of time stamping a visual capture of the network and then be able to see how it changes over time would be valuable. The first aha moment we had was when we took this visualization of the utilization and they could see immediately that there was congestion in the Northeast, congestion in the Los Angeles and uh, San Diego area. And they're able to zero in on that and say, well, why? Is that a number of users or a number of services that are on the line or is that outdated equipment? And it ended up being a mixture of the two. But so that first aha moment was something that spurred us on to say, this, this may be worth using inside of Tableau because Tableau is really not built to deal with these kind of point-to-point -point networks. And then, of course, they had additional questions of, I want to understand wavelength spacing because certain configurations require wider spacing. So in building this model for this presentation, I took, let me see if I can find the stats on this thing. We originally had 300 sites across the US. We originally had right around 1,100 fiber links. And we had roughly 800 services, which translates into 6,000 ports that we had to be able to monitor the stats for. In uh, simplifying this down, I'm using NFL cities, which is far less than uh, 300, unless there's something the NFL hasn't told me. Uh, 30, 32 site cities. We have 73 links, and we have 180 services that I manually defined so that we could demonstrate the different features inside of Tableau. Now, you would think that if the questions are fairly simple, I want to understand capacity. I want to understand how to best plan my network so I can avoid wavelength blockage. I want to understand where my services are running. Those are pretty generic questions. And it's because you have this huge scale in front of you that it's just insurmountable. Every time you get to a certain point, you roll right back down the hill again. So when we went in and we were taking a look and saying, well, here's sort of the life cycle of building out a service. You first, under the customer says, I need a 10 gig line from, New York, from San Francisco to New York. You say, okay, great. Then you check to see, is it available? Is there, is there a way for me to make, make that happen? You, design, you create the design specs, you quote it out, you provision it, and you support it. Unfortunately, this kind of process can take up to 120 days because you're manually going through all those files to make sure everything is right. And if you're doing something that's crossing organizational boundaries, like going from the Southwest to New York, you may be going through the Southwest, South Central, Southeast, and up to Mid-Atlantic, and finally getting up to the Northeast. You're dealing with five managers who have their own sets of spreadsheets and their own kind of way of doing things. And then you don't even know whether or not you figured out an optimal solution for it all. And then once you've figured it out and it comes to provisioning it, you want to make sure you're using the best use of your labor and your other resources. So we decided that we were to tackle feasibility and design because customer requirement, we were really not pushing on the customer, customer demand. Ideally, you could turn around and once you figure out feasibility, you could say, you could have this link or this particular service with this amount of latency for this price, and, or you could go for this other one with a little higher latency for a lower price, which one would you want? That is a question that you can now answer with this type of modeling. So here are some of the challenges we ended up having. 
One of the questions that they had was, when we took a look at individual services, how would we manage to gauge that? How do we know which boxes the service goes through and be able to pinpoint it's sort of a trace route inside of layer three where we could take a look at every single box it went through. In the model that we have, uh, we were able to do that through the individual box. Now, optical boxes are strange animals. I'm getting a lot of reverb here. Uh, Optical boxes are strange animals because you have to go and create, take the optical wavelength, demux it, convert it to electrical, process it, remux it, and send it back out again. So you might end up having five or six cards that a, a signal has to go through in order to make to the next hop. And in any of those cards, they have versions and they may be incompatible, they may be being retired, or they may be wanting to upgrade and you need to know the impact of all the services that are riding through those boxes. So it ends up being uh, pretty tricky. The other part is the truthiness. So we've met, we talked about, or you've heard about that a little bit on the keynote this morning. The truthiness of the information that you have. The inventory database is not current. It isn't kept up to date as, as well as it should. What do you do from a design perspective? Do you turn around and say, well, you throw that data out? Do you make assumptions about that data, or do you push back? And we ended up pushing back, and they ended up cleaning up their inventory database quite well. So we took this and, and said, well, you know, basically there are three things that we want to be able to take it, to deal with, three basic questions, and make it easy to understand and use. You know, we want to get away from the spreadsheets, we want to get away from the Visio diagrams, we want to be able to provide a single screen for an engineer, planner, or executive to be able to look at their network and understand what's going on. And this is your basic type of format. <clears throat> you may have Links may do an optical bypass and completely bypass this site and go straight over here as well. Services will span many links and you often don't know exactly how far they go or uh, how they're laid out. And it's a lot easier to draw this kind of thing from a wavelength blockage standpoint because it's linear. It's not on a map to be able to give you a little bit of uh, feeling. And this is, the, this is the pit we fell into. I've, I've seen some smiles in the, in the group here. Uh, when you're an engineering firm and you're working with engineers as your customers, you tend to fall into the assumption that what they want is what you want. And that gauges and measurements and numbers all over the place and tables are great and uh, and that they really don't want to shift the way they're doing things because they feel there's a certain stability associated with that. So in prioritized order, we said tables, filters, gauges, and then, oh yeah, we might want to have a map associated with that. And that we want to have one-stop shopping. One place to go because that, that way everybody will be working off the same thing. So we ended up putting menus and filters. <clears throat> Big table, gotta love that table. Wavelength utilization was a graphic that showed there are 88 channels in, in most optical networks. We wanted to be able to display those and say which ones are being used. Oh, we have gauges, gotta have gauges because gauges are cool. And then somewhere in the middle of that, we had this tiny, tiny map that said, this is what your network looks like, and, and uh, you know, that did not go over well. Uh, I wonder if you've seen the same things in, you, in where, we, where you work, where when you have an engineering or technical firm where people really understand the nuts and bolts. They feel like all the nuts and bolts that they have have to be displayed. And that, that's the, the, the notion of summary information is kind of foreign to them because once you get summarized, uh, somehow the value is diluted. 
The other problem we ran into, the second bullet item, was that, that we already had a product that was written in Tableau that was that would, would fulfill about 90% of what they had, what they wanted, but the interface was like you saw in the previous slide. That and we felt that, well, this looks like it might work because we built that for engineers. These are engineers, and why not, you know, reuse it, tweak a little bit, shove it out the door, we'd be good to go, right? Not nah, wrong. And there is a certain amount of glee associated with, I have 140,000 rows of inf information, or I have half a million rows of information, and that this ends up being, you know, it's as if the, the, the weight of the information was the currency rather than the business value. And then the, the notion of the map as not being the interface through which you find your information, but being a footnote, it's more like eye candy whereas the real information is somewhere else. And there was this, pre, this bias associated with that. And the result was the customer looked at it and said, I can't, I can't use this. It doesn't help me drive any business decisions. How do I know that I need to increase uh, bandwidth between these two locations? It just doesn't give me that information uh, unless I click through a lot of different pieces and, and finally understand what those gauges meant. So we took this, we created several different workbooks along the bottom, created a standardized set of filters and parameters, made tables more of its own footnote, made the map a lot larger. Oh, sorry, I went a little bit too far there. And this way, this ends up being the interface. You, you create parameters that will work across several worksheets or several dashboards. You use the filters judiciously so you're not slowing down the displays. You have help text in the lower left-hand corner that's consistent so that you can say, here's a step-by-step -step approach that you may want to use for whatever the task is at hand, whether it's planning or understanding utilization, tracing a service, uh, taking a look at trying to stitch, stitch the different cir circuits together. And the tables end up responding to clicking on the individual links. So if I clicked on the Dallas to Atlanta link, I would see Dallas to Atlanta specific information. Or you can click select a group of links and learn more about it that way. And we wanted to have that as a consistent way of looking at, l having them look at the world. So the numbers conversation changed to a business conversation. Business and process information, that there is a willingness on the part of the engineers to say, hey, you know what, if I don't have to deal with those things, those spreadsheets and those Visio diagrams and the PDFs and all the other kind of stuff, I'm good with that. The other part of it is that when they saw that first mock-up with all the gauges and everything else, they said, that's too distracting. How do I end up doing my business? Because all I really want to do is connect the dots. I want to create these links and create a service that goes between these two locations. So the revised priorities put maps at the top. And then we also took a look at the use cases of the individuals and said, one-stop shopping doesn't make sense if an executive wants a summary of information and a planner needs to have detailed information, why do you want to inflict that on the executive? Give them something that's more streamlined where they can make an active decision. And then if they want to go into the other dashboard to take a look, great, not a big problem. And the first thing they consult are maps. So conceptually, inside of Tableau, Tableau, you're usually used to seeing things like this. This is population density per square kilometer per country, and where you've created some, some level of gradation. Metro map in London, this is a little bit closer to where we would have like in a network map. That is uh, all the flights that go between JFK and London Heathrow. And then, of course, road maps and area maps. And each one of those types of maps carries a different type of information, has a different uh, transience to it. 
and different multiple levels of detail. I'd say that the Las Vegas map in the middle is probably closest to what you might have inside of an optical map. Because an optical map, what you end up doing is creating point-to-point -point links. And in here, we have them cutting across to a different wavelength in Chicago. And here we have a direct path. And these are considered disparate paths because if you were a stockbroker in San Francisco, you'd want to make sure that if one link went down, you'd have another path to get to the network. And you, do, you would not want to have any uh, common, common equipment along the way. And for those of you to, who are not familiar with optical networking, this is your cheat sheet on that. So typically, uh, this, is, this is all fixed grid. There are flexible flex grid te technologies out there, but right now we were focusing on fixed grid, where you could take that single link and that 88, 88 wavelengths can each support 100 gig. So we're looking at 8.8 .8 terabits possible across a single span, a uh, single fiber, which is pretty phenomenal. So before I go into what the demonstration looks like, I, I thought it might make sense to show you how easy it is to create a map. And so I dumped this inside of the presentation that you can find inside of TC Live. Basically, you have sites, you have links, you have a link upload. Now, inside of 10.4, that link upload could just be 0.1, 0.2, Point three and be able to put them into an order, each one with its own latitude and longitude, and, and associate that uh, sequence inside of the path parameter inside the screens, inside of that um, workbook. And for those of you who haven't really looked closely at the URLs inside of Google Maps, when you do something like, I want to look at Newark, New Jersey, woo, uh, you'll see the latitude longitude where it's circled. And you can grab that and paste that in as a data variable. Or you could do a dynamic query with Google API in order to pull that information out. Uh, we did a mixture of those inside, you know, because we were dealing with several hundred locations. We were also focused on the specific street addresses for the central offices that ha had that gear in it, because we wanted to be as precise as possible in terms of the original latitude and longitude. In terms of display, we would then create an offset so that if you had a bunch of these in downtown Manhattan, they could not possibly be physically located you know, on a national map in a way that makes sense. So you might do some uh, perturbation to be able to split them apart. But getting the latitude longitude is the first, first step. Here are the step-by-step -step pieces. I'm not going to talk through that because we'll take a look at it this way. Once you've grabbed your latitude and longitude file, you're able to drag latitude and longitude twice into the columns up above. You can click on those, mark them as dual access. Now this area over here ends up having two data fields in it. You change one of those to be a line, and you get a heartbeat. This is where you say, crap, I just messed up. Where do I go from here? Uh, the, and you need to kind of suspend that disbelief in yourself because all you need to do at this point is drag in the link ID and boom, the links pop up. So it's very simple to be able to create a, a general map that way and then you can drag in city and have that shown as a, as a data point. Make sense? So when we were dealing with mileage heat map requests, this was the original piece that took us about six weeks to build uh, for one of our customers. And then they would say, you know, along the side axes, you would have destination location, just like a highway map does. And you could see then the places that are marked red only have two wavelengths available out of 88. And this is where you say, oh, there's a big problem. Yes, there is a big problem but it doesn't really give you any sense from a three-dimensional standpoint how best to deal with it. So
So if we were to take a look at wavelength blockage in a very uh, elementary standpoint, we could see then if you're going through this location and you have something prior to point A and, and after J, the only available spot to go through is wavelength 4 or channel 4. And you would also see then that if you really wanted to optimize this, you take this guy here and this guy here and you'd move them both to 1 to free that up, and then you would have three channels available. So you can see there's a, real, there's a real possibility for optimization this way. And when I, th when I think about where this type of approach might help, uh, I think about trucking and distribution, I think about airlines, I think about energy. I, uh, you can also think about this in terms of, instead of this being optical going left to right, these could be slices of time. And if these were cloud resources that had different durations of time, which resource would they tap into in order to have a better packing? So th that's uh, something to ponder. OK, so we have three things we want to uh, talk about here, understanding the capacity and utilization, planning new services, and taking advantage of existing services. And if this computer works, then we're good to go. So this is Tableau. Uh, they graciously provided a, a laptop that I have uh, never used before. So anyway, the, the different ty types of things from a design perspective that we like to focus on here is typically we do put in a front page that says basically what does each of the individual dashboards do for you. We have in here the site Site file. And inside the top here, because we're dealing with NFL teams, maybe it makes more sense to show Broncos. Maybe it makes more sense if you are the engineer to have a site ID. Now, inside an optical environment, the site ID is called a silly code, C L L I, which is somewhere between 16 and 20 characters long. And the engineers, when they're taking a look at plotting out a path, will use those as familiar as anything else. And then the executive would turn around and say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I want city, state. And the way I did that was using a parameter in the calculated field. The parameter is what you see on the lookup there. And the calculated field will take a look at the parameter and then based on the value of the parameter, pull in those values out of the underlying database. And then also to satisfy the use of some of the regional managers, they may turn around and say, you know what, I only really want to deal with in a certain area of my network. And so we have a regional filter to be able to pull in and focus on that. And when you have 300 locations, not 32, this ends up easing their burden a lot, but a lot along the way. Especially when they're planning new circuits, they can turn around and, and on the fly add a region and say, oh, what, wait a minute here. I only want to focus on Southwest because I'm doing California or San Francisco to Miami. I'll focus on Southwest first. And then once I get through Dallas, I want to add the Southeast section and, then, and put that in. And the Tableau map ends up becoming a much more live thing for them. So that's the sites. Utilization. We have the same type of information. We, I try to duplicate the site label parameter on every sheet so that if they want to flip back and forth between uh, parameter, you know, the city, state, or the site ID, they could do that. I'm going to just flip that back to city just because it's. There you go. And notice that it also changes the name of the link down below here. So if I wanted to do site ID on that lower portion, I get just the numbers down below. So we, what we're doing here is letting both of the tables look at those as calculated variables. And then I have marks. I've added marks in for the number of channels being used. 
and I also create, I also use size, so the thicker lines end up being uh, more representational. The thing that I think is best about this from a Tableau standpoint are the tooltips, because I can highlight now a tooltip and it will tell me how many channels are currently used, how many channels are available, what are the percentages, and uh, it just gets them that much faster to an answer one sort or another. If you select an individual link down below, you will get that link up above. If you, if you select links up here, you get that individual link. That doesn't really help you all that much from an, a utilization standpoint, but if you wanted to take a look at a, a group of links, you would then get that subset down below that might be helpful. Now here is an example where we've done the San Francisco to Washington DC link and I've done control click to highlight the available channels. And inside of here green means that the channel is available, black means it's being used. And once again I have the same map as before so there's familiarity associated with that. And so if I show this and I can highlight the link. And we'll go ahead and go up to Newark. Now, this shows you the available bandwidth, and you could see then that if you go into 70 and 71, you're not able to go all the way through. You want to find a green line that goes all the way through this, the individual spots. Now, one of the questions that the executive had in mind was he wants to understand regional compliance. He said, he said services that cross regional boundaries need to occupy a certain set of wavelengths. And, we, and in order to deal with that issue we had earlier, where we showed the five and having only one of them available, he said, if we manage to look at individual regions and look internally, we should be able to see most of the wavelengths appearing in the lower end of the spectrum. And if we're taking a look at the ones that are cutting across individual boundaries, we should be able to cut that through. So what I did is I said, let's take a look at uh, just a subset of those wavelengths. And we're able to shrink that down in order to not have too much data in front of the user uh, if they don't want to have it. The other thing I did here is, I'm going back to the utilization one. I forgot to show you this. This is pretty cool. So if you say, I only want to take a look at the upper, upper echelon of the pieces that are being used, I could turn around and say, show me only the minimal, minimally used links, or I want to show the ones that are, let's put that about there, highest used. So use these sliders here. The trick here, from a Tableau perspective, is the filters that you're seeing here are based on values, metrics, measures, whereas the display values you have as part of the marks are dimensions. So you create a calculated value that goes into the measures section, and then the dimension piece, because wavelengths being used, if it's going across multiple segments, you don't want to have them added up to where you suddenly have twice the number of channels displayed as part of the mark. So there's a little bit of nuance there from a, a Tableau perspective. I fondly call this the spider web uh, for good reason. This is the instance where they get a call, the executive gets a call directly from uh, a VP saying such and so and so wants a hundred gig or wants a ten gig connection next week. Now, if they're dealing with a hundred and twenty day window, what do you do? You take a look at existing services and say, is there a way for me to patch those services together in order to make some sense of it? So, what I do here is I can take this and I can only look at the services that are, are available. And so now I have the 40 gig where the 10, there's a four by 10 card, 
and there's a 10 by 10 card, and we can see those color coded so that the Washington to San Francisco is a 10 by 10 card. And I can also see then how many ports are used and how are the ports used, ports available, and then a listing of those ports so that when we get down to it, they can turn around and say, grab this port, put a physical fiber jumper between this port and this port in these couple different locations, and you're able to stitch that service together much faster than having to go through and, and manually create something. So it ends up becoming pretty powerful that way. Uh, you can also turn around and say, well, if I, if I need to have two ports available, is there a subset that would make sense there? And if I wanted to take a look at an individual link, I can also highlight that down below. And so those same types of uh, selections are available that way. Lastly, we have something called a service trace. So you, you kind of want to understand whether or not a particular service is available. Let's see if we can have, there we go, Let me turn this off. So here is the, here I highlighted a service name saying San Francisco to Washington, 10 by 10, and all the individual services that fulfill that criteria are showing up with varying levels of ports being available. And now I can turn around and highlight one of them to see what, the, what it may look like and what path it will take. So this is one path that's possible. I could take a look at another one here. And this is how you take a look at those disparate paths to figure out, is there a way where we're not overlapping going through Atlanta, for example? So there's that one. I think if I go, yeah, it just hops up to Denver. The other part that I was dealing with, because we didn't have the extensions API, was how do you take this and export it into a meaningful format? And because we were dealing with pre-version 10.2 at the time, uh, if you have a map like this and you have it on server or you have it on reader, it gets very confused when you say, I want to export. It will automatically try to export the image on the top and forget about the table down below. So what I did is I created duplicates of the individual dashboards. So service trace here has a service trace table here that's text only. So when, it's, when it comes to exporting that table, we're able to pull it directly off of this particular table instead of the one that has graphics and table mixed in together. Hopefully with the uh, extensions API, we won't have to worry about that. So, if I get back to and you get the flickering. Oh, that's hard. That's harsh. Okay, so. Do you want me to try? What? It's like, don't breathe on it. <laughs> OK, so uh, inside of the uh, live version of the presentation, I have cop carbon, or I haven't copied the presentation sample slides in here. So the common, th the common things that we, I tried to do here is if they're dealing with uh, multiple dashboards, try to keep those dashboards as similar as possible to each other. So I put in the parameters and filters. Normally when you build out a dashboard, the, uh, the filters end up on the right-hand side, which is all fine and dandy, except when you're dealing with multiple screen sizes and screen resolutions. So I, took, I typically drag those filters and parameters over to the left-hand side of fixed column width. Uh, so that you can have a consistent look and feel regardless of the type of monitor being used. Try to keep it down to a few fonts and a few styles, so bold, minimal italics. Uh, 
The uh, parameters and actions simplify tasks. You see that from the demonstration that I tried to make it so that the map is used to collect, to select, to filter, and the tool tips end up providing a certain level of detail that, uh, that you can get or duplicate in the tables down below. So you can either hover, hover over a bunch of different pieces or you can select a subset and then view them down below. Either one is possible. It's, it's always possible to take, take something and provide unlimited depth into what you want to try to display. And Tableau is, I've worked on other dashboards where if there's no data, that particular frame disappears for the most part. And you can flip then between different views on, inside the same dashboard. I avoided that here because I felt like I wanted to I wanted to respect the different use cases and the different people involved in the planning and the uh, capacity discussions. But as a matter of, of saying, what things are no longer important if I'm the executive? Strip those out. What things are no longer important if I'm a planner? Strip those out. Get back to the basics of how do I create business value rather than trying to provide a wealth of information which ends up just distracting them. The other thing that I think is funny is, at, I'm sure you've seen this as well, that when you start talking to your customer and unfolding what Tableau will do for them, and they start seeing actions and tool tips, things that they've never seen inside of an Excel spreadsheet or a database application, it opens up new questions. They say, well, what about this? What if I take these two pieces? And, and so the question of maintenance windows, if I'm operating on two different segments of the network, if I select both of those, can I find out whether or not I have any customers common to them both so that I'm not creating a lapse in service? Those types of things end up surfacing because they didn't have access to that information before. So it becomes really exciting that way. And almost as a coda, I wanted, I wanted to mention data mediation. Uh, the, tool, the way I was pulling this information out of our network management software was with SQL queries in, as part of a batch process. And even in that kind of environment, when you're trying to scan for the 300 nodes and re having the nodes reporting all their information into servers, you'll get, inf get incomplete information. And you need to understand where that falls through the, through the holes, where there are holes in the data and gaps, where there are anomalies, where can you say, well, New Jersey or New Newark was there last week, why isn't there there this week? Did they turn it off? Uh, or is there a fiber break someplace? So that's, this notion of incomplete data, all of our SQL queries are time stamped and rolled into this so that you can then turn around and do a filter based on timestamp and say, show me what it looked like last week, show me what it looks like this week, and through that time stamping, you end up opening the door to the next phase of this project, which would be the predictive nature of where are we seeing service, services growing the fastest. And that's where the Tableau analysis side of things really kicks into gear. That, so that's kind of all sorts of fun. Uh, I used LavaStorm for this particular application just because I was familiar with it. Uh, but Alteryx would be another tool to use to, to deal with this, and maybe even Maestro once, uh, once you start playing around with it. The other part of this I, that I took into consideration, because we also we didn't have Hyper, uh, was the rendering time for a, a, a complex network where you have you know, 1,100 links that you need to be able to manage and display. You have the population of all the tool tips. You have uh, regional filters and calculated fields that you needed to deal with. If you had too much in the way of calculated fields, the rendering of, of this application inside of server would be incredibly slow. So every click would require a recalculation. So to help mitigate that, we pushed a lot of those calculated fields back inside the data mediation so that Tableau itself could focus on the pure rendering. The downside of that is when you've already po when you've populated things that you would normally see as calculated fields like percentage used or channels occupied or uh, number of services on a particular link, 
When that's not a dynamic calculated field, it's going to occupy space inside of the data mediation data source. So you have to kind of weigh those two concerns. And we chose to push it into the front end to be able to make the flow work, work a little bit faster for the customer. And there really was an outage that had they known about, had they been able to see the capacity issues coming up, they would have been able to avert. And so with that, I am seven minutes ahead of schedule for questions. If, if you want to ask me anything along these lines. I mean, is this something new? Have you seen Tableau being used in this way before? OK. It's not bad. It, it, it is the kind of thing where that's one of the reasons we did the regions. Because once you focused on Northeast region and you'd have the zoom out on that, you're able to see uh, those nodes a lot more clearly. When you have something that's packed in, it becomes a little bit more uh, problematic. So that's one of the reasons we did the regions. The other thing the customer uh, still wants is to take out all the amplifiers and only show Rotom to Rotom connections in order to keep the, keep the count down. Uh, and that would also simplify the display quite a bit. What? I think what I would do with, with amplifiers, so amplifiers, all they're doing is boosting the signal. They're not pulling any wavelengths off. So I would probably use a parameter and say, do you want to show the amps or not? and they'd probably turn it off and leave it off until they wanted to get into true provisioning and saying, well, what amps is that thing going through? I yeah. Uh, that is a, yes, what I did inside of that is the network management software would tell us which channels were actually being used and then I went in through LavaStorm to say, well, what about all the other guys? Let's mark them as unused and be able to build that out as a child database. So you did a something, list something like that. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, one more, and then we'll go over here. Uh, the service that you did, mm -hmm. did you do like some graph Yes, well, when we're taking a look at the service, well, first of all, this, this service information is fictitious. Uh, but certainly, one of the things that we would do is take a look and say, if you wanted to get from San Francisco, San Francisco to Newark, New Jersey, what's the spread of hop possibilities? And then we can also take a look at latency uh, of all those different possibilities. The other thing we have as a related tool is a fiber health analysis to take a look at those individual links and pull off live data on um, noise to signal or signal to noise ratios so we can take a look at fiber as it's degrading and saying there's this probably going to be a break sometime in the near future and be able to be able to jump on that ahead of time. So go. Directional flow in an optical network, uh, optical networks are bidirectional. So, so it would be hard to be able to say it's going this way and this way and, and going around. So one of the things I was looking at, just for fun, uh, during all your free time, right, is taking a look at polygons. And last week I was drawing polygons for each of those individual links where you could put arrowheads on as a shape of the polygon. That, uh, that requires a lot of analytic geometry in order to get it so it maps on a Mercator map properly. Uh, but it's, but th I think that's one way of doing it where you could show arrows and bidirectional flow, and you could also get the label to show at the mid-span, which is another issue you have with this. Yeah? Uh, you have 
you are using, well, the, from the link database, I have 73 links. And so the 73 links end up doubling up because you have to show a point and then a location. And, and then you have to do the reverse as well. So one of the reasons I split this up into several use cases is when you're taking a look at service map flows, it'd be great to have service map flow directly on the network utilization map. But the problem there is when you're looking at it graphically, those services are laying on top of each other. So when you click on it, you don't know which one you're clicking on. You could lasso it and get all three or all five or all 50, but it really wouldn't give you the information you need. So I put all of those on a separate t a dashboard for that purpose. Yeah. Administrated. Oh, wow. Uh, the only thing we've looked at there is because these are, these are batch processes that are handled in the middle of the night because they don't want to disrupt the existing service traffic uh, overload on, on the individual nodes, we could do, we could do a, a weekly refresh and pull that down and to be able to show that over time. But, we have, but that is used purely as a filter, not as a something to be able to show progression over time. But I was noticing that the latest, uh, the 10.4 map tutorial shows the hurricanes, hurricane pathing is really cool. And I think that something like that might end up working out pretty well. And there would be a way to apply that. Yes. Uh, in, this, in this version, I used the size to indicate number of wavelengths being used, but there's nothing to prevent me from saying this is a 40 gig link, this is a 100 gig link, or this is a... Uh, actually, in, in optical world, you have 44 channels or 88 channels or flex grid, and you could use, use color coding or uh, thickness to be able to demonstrate that. Yes? It is a raw batch extract, so it's not, it's not a live database query. I'd love it to be a live database query, but that would be something that would create a lot of overhead on the nodes themselves. Uh, in, in time, we'll probably get there, though. So, Ashley alluded to earlier, but uh, the graph, DB prep, to show all the relationships, right? You had to have done some, some type of preparation of that from your source links, like here's my network, what are my path options, right? Uh, what technology did you use, like Neo4j or like a graph that you used to prep that? Hold on. If you, are, if you would be kind, to go ahead and fill out the survey stuff at the end. I just want to make sure that's there. Uh, ask the question again. Like path through the network when you're selecting, like from this A and D, showing all your possible paths. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I saw where you had that op option. I was, I was doing a control click in order to select individual links. Uh, we did toy with the idea of saying, if I want to go to San Francisco to New York, show me every possible path through the network to be able to make that happen uh, of the ones that have wavelengths available and what yeah. the latency might be. The problem there is you end up with a factorial problem that it, it ends up be creating a monster database that creates, that, yeah, and, and so I, I, we avoided that. The other thing that we, tr we, we, we were looking at is having the customer predefine here are the top five paths for each A to Z pair and preloading that into the database so that we could then have that as an option. Now, we opted in, in the long run to say keep it simple, keep it straightforward, and uh, if, if you've then designed a path, you could then check to see whether or not that path has been used someplace else. Yes? Do you have any needs to represent the network on a granular scale? What condition? The, so, need to display the network in, in more. Within city bus and the board, because it is right now, it's using the same thing. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, there, there is there is a need to be able to to zoom in on like Manhattan, for example, and to be able to take a look at a block length standpoint. And I could turn around and use the uh, uh, dynamic latitude longitude to be able to make something like that happen. Uh, but for the most part, be, this particular network is is used to connect at a fairly regional level, and it's not it's not small cell kind of things. So we've been able to avoid additional layers of detail. Sure. Ah, Windstream. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it provides food for thought. OK. Well, if there are no more questions, I enjoyed having you here. Hopefully you got something out of it. And I have my card if you want to pick, pick it up.